Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and welcome to this edition of Revealing Prophecy. <clears throat> Each week we connect the dots of the news from around the globe with biblical prophecy and talk about what was, what is, and what is to come. The monologue is our original work, and all other articles are used giving credit to their respective sources. We invite you to visit ignitinganation.com for a full roster of daily interviews, and we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter and YouTube channel so you never have to miss out on any special offers or events. Here's a quick look at what we, we will be covering on today's show. I'll be giving my opening monologue, fo followed by a story from Gatestone Institute, Iran to have the nuclear bomb in a few months, question mark. From the AP News, the Attorney General Netanyahu not required to resign. From JNS, Iran is planning attacks on Israel, Netanyahu. And HonestReporting.com gives us a summary of the charges against ben Benjamin Netanyahu and an explanation. As we study prophecy and we look at the Bible, if you were to look at a place in the bookstore or in the library where you might find the Bible, it would be in the prophecy section. In the Bible, there's approximately 2,500 prophecies of which around 2,000 have already been fulfilled exactly as God described them. Given that the Bible proves so reliable a document, there's every reason to expect that the remaining 500 prophecies, those slated for the time of the end, also will be fulfilled to the last letter. Who can afford to ignore these coming events, much less miss out on the immeasurable blessings offered to anyone and everyone who submits to the control of the Bible's author, God himself? Would a reasonable person take lightly God's warning of judgment for those who reject what they know to be true about Jesus and the Bible, or who reject Jesus' claim on their lives? And now for my opening remarks. Last week, I was interviewing Stephen Strang, head of Charisma Media, about his soon-to-be-released new book, God, Trump, and the 2020 Election. In that interview, we discussed many of the pros and many of the concerns we both shared about the president. As I reviewed the interview and the book, I felt we took a balanced, albeit pro-Trump, view. During that interview, we spent a great deal of time expressing concern over the potential for the body of believers to not get out and vote. In our analysis of the president, the subject of the president's tweets came up. Both Steve Strang and I agreed that we wished that the president was less engaged in tweeting and more focused on matters of state. As the discussion continued, we began to take a candid look at how Jesus took on the establishment and the power brokers, the Pharisees. The interview lasted about 55 minutes, and a week later, Right Wing Watch released a headline that says, Eric Walker, Trump is a modern-day prophet taking on the Pharisees just like Jesus. They actually took a 1 minute and 38 second clip out of the 55 minute interview and transcribed it where I'm quoted as a part of the very balanced narrative as saying, and I quote, during a recent broadcast of his Revealing the Truth program, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker of Igniting a Nation Ministries declared that Donald Trump is a modern day prophet who has a lot in common with Jesus Christ. And also in quotes, if you were to take the gospel message, this is what I said, and break it down to some of the things that Jesus said and put them in a tweet, there are some things that Jesus said that would really absolutely send people the edge, over the edge, no different than Donald Trump standing up against the swamp, standing up against the establishment and making these same statements. I went on to say it really, it's really no different than 2,000 years ago when, when Jesus was taking on the Pharisees and the establishment. It parallels it in the exact same way. The article says Walker said that the Democrats today are the modern-day Pharisees and Trump in his own way is a modern-day prophet, one who is willing to call sin, sin, call evil, evil, call wicked, wicked, and this is something that has upset people in power for over 2,000 years. 
Yes, when you cut out the context and the narrative before and after that statement was made, you might come away believing that I was declaring Donald Trump as a modern day prophet. If you see the words in his own way, you see that it's a simile, a metaphor, a, a comparison, but it's certainly not a declaration. <clears throat> so you might come away believing that I was declaring him as a modern day prophet. And then the emails be began, and the most vocal were from the Mormons, the Church of the Latter-day Saints. These emails were so filled with hate and malice that I was told in no uncertain terms that I was going to hell from my statements, and that unless I issue a public retraction of referring to Donald Trump in any way on the prophetic spectrum, I will burn for eternity for blaspheming the teachings of Joseph Smith. Furthermore, these individuals stated that they've been ordained by God through Russell, Russell M. Nelson, who has been the president of the LDS since January 14th of 2018. The Latter-day Saints consider the church's president to be God's spokesman to the entire world and the highest priesthood authority on earth with the exclusive right to receive revelations from God on behalf of the entire church or the entire world. The writers went on to say that they had been ordained as priests in the order of Melchizedek and that I was now made known to the entire church of the Latter-day Saints and under official condemnation. Whoa! Here I thought that the fatwa that I had been told of that would cost me my life if I went into certain Muslim countries was serious, but this is obviously a much more grievous offense than making any comments about Muhammad. I had no idea that these clean-cut young men going door to door wielded such amazing power to determine life and death and declare me to be under indictment by their church. I had no idea that there were around 15 million later Latter-day Saints as they refer to themselves now instead of Mormon. As a Jewish believer, I readily admit that I may have made no attempt to dig into the doctrinal and theological positions of denominational Christianity. I am woefully ignorant of the associated practices, rules, and regulations that distinguish one denomination from another. To be quite candid, it's just too confusing when you have people praying to Jesus and his mother and praying to saints. Then you have the body divided by baptismal practices and gifts of the Spirit and which part of the Bible is optional or if you just throw out the first half. According to the World Christian Encyclopedia, at, published by Oxford University Press, world Christianity consists of six major ecclesi e ecclesiastical cultural blocks divided into 300 major ecclesiastical traditions composed of over 33,000 distinct denominations in 238 countries, according to Volume 1, page 16. So according to the World Christian Encyclopedia, the 33,000 figure represents world Christianity. Now, unless a Catholic wants to suppose that world Christianity means Protestantism, the number would have to be something less. 33,000, according to the source from which the number comes, means the whole of Christianity, not Protestantism specifically. The World Christian Encyclopedia then goes on to break down world Christianity into the following broad categories. Independents, 22,000 denominations. Protestants, 9,000 denominations. Marginals, 1,600 denominations. Orthodox, 781 denominations. Catholics, 242 denominations. And Anglicans, 168 denominations. That's 33,791 denominations of Christianity. Now you can see why I decided when I came to faith at age 44 that I would focus my attention on learning the scriptures and not man's practices. Imagine my utter confusion when I read Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. 
when did that change and why didn't anybody tell me? Imagine my confusion, or even more so, imagine the confusion of every Jewish person who reads of the infighting among the denominations. And then, if that's not enough, the infighting inside the denominations. Is no one aware that the world is watching this tragic comedy unfold where God and Jesus are not being edified, but man is at war against other men as to what role women should play in the church? That's a huge stumbling block for a matriarchal people like my people, the Jews. Or the debate over what is sin or what is acceptable human behavior. Is the Bible not clear on these matters that the world has to have conferences and debates about the same folly that our own government is engaged in? It's embarrassing to say the least, say it the least in trying to engage in Jewish apologetics where the very behavior of any of the 39,000 denominations of Christianity is enough to turn even the most devout believer away from what we call the church today. The fact that we publicize the decline and then elevate the fastest growing church as if that is what this is all about. Have we become so egotistical about our church that we've forgotten all about the Great Commission and living a Christ-like life? How is it that horror movies and pornography and every form of debauchery is being condoned and the response is, well, we're all in a fallen world? Well, certainly that is true, but we were called to be set apart, and even though all of us are uh, laced with temptation and many succumb to it, God used David and his contrite heart as an example as to how we can stumble yet by his grace we can stand and become people after God's own heart. If I as a Jewish believer am confused as to what it means to be a Christian because there's no one clear definition that all Christians adhere to, then why are we surprised that the message isn't getting out and people are turning away from the church? And by what grace, love, and mercy do 15 million people show me by condemning me to hell for a soundbite published by a radical right-wing website? Since Jesus is not coming back until the Jews call for his return, don't you think we should act more loving and tolerant and forgiving than the rest of the non-believing world? Or has the body of Christ forgotten Paul's admonition in Romans 11? Or he writes, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall certainly not but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy salvation has come to the gentiles now if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the gentiles how much more their fullness for i speak to you gentiles and as much as i'm an apostle to the gentiles i magnify my ministry if by any means i may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits it is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive branch were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity but toward you goodness if you continue in his goodness otherwise you also will be cut off and if they also if they do not continue in unbelief will be grafted in for god is able to graft them in again for if you are cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. 
And so all of Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, you have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. As we approach Thanksgiving and Christmas, maybe it's time to rethink the message and the messenger. The message has not changed. Jesus died for our sins. Shouldn't that mean something more than just I get my sins forgiven and receive eternal life? We are all called to be his messengers. Are we too busy fighting with each other over doctrine that we have forgotten that we're supposed to be ambassadors of heaven? Are we really presenting something more attractive than what the world has to offer? God himself says he did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world. If God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, then how is it that, that believers are condemning each other? And then that opens the door to who's a believer. And we're back to the beginning as to what I don't understand about Christianity. I'm a believer in Jesus as the promised Jewish Messiah. I am still Jewish and did not convert to anything. My body has been circumcised, but now my heart has also been. My heart of stone has been replaced with the heart of flesh. I try daily to do a better job of being kinder, more loving, more considerate, more understanding. I have my good days and some not so good, but what is the face of Christianity to the world? We are the messengers, and if we're going to be just as divisive and vindictive and condemning as the rest of the non-believing world, then what value is there in being a believer? Are we becoming so self-centered that we forgot the Great Commission was to go out and make disciples of the world? One gospel, one Jesus, one Holy Spirit, one God. We have so much to be thankful for and all we seem to do is argue over the things that divide us as opposed to the uniting through the shed blood of Messiah. If the gospel was given to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy, isn't it time we gave them something to be jealous of? What if we just started showing a little love to one another and were a reflection of the unmerited love poured out on us? To those who wrote me and condemned me to hell, my father says you are wrong. And we will pray for you and the other five and a half billion others around the world that do not know the truth of God's word. The larger question is, do you know the truth of God's word? My prayer for you and all of those around the world is that you would know the truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In verse 18 it says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Our calling to be set apart. Not set apart to fight with each other. But to reconcile man to God. And become ambassadors of heaven. Bringing a message of love. Of inclusion, not exclusion. Not a set of legalism and rules and regulations to abide by, but to walk in love. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. 
from all of us here at Igniting a Nation, we wish you a light-filled and joyful Thanksgiving. And we are eternally thankful for you. And that, my friends, is today's monologue.